in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from ayah number 32, He talks about two individuals. He talks about two men. And the scholars of tafsir, they mention that they were two Muslims. So Allah says, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ أَعْنَابِ وَحَفَفْنَاهُمَا بِنَخْلٍ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمَا زَرْعًا And put forth unto them the example of two men, two individuals. So we have two men, two individuals. And one of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ for one of these two individuals, we had given unto him two gardens, subhanAllah, two gardens. Min a'nab, full of grapes. We're talking about vineyards, two gardens full of grapes. Wahafafnahuma bi nakhl. And what did we do? Allah says in the Quran, we gave him gardens, two gardens full of grapes. And we had these gardens surrounded, hafafnahuma, surrounded by date palms. Wajalna bainahuma zara. And we also placed within these grapes and the date palms other vegetation as well. Now firstly, you have to understand that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the assets of an individual in the Quran, it's pretty significant. Allah talks about Qarun and the wealth of Qarun. Allah says he's, he was wealthy. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declaring it in the Quran, not, not Forbes, not all these other you know magazines that talk about the wealth of an individual. No, Allah the Almighty, he is saying that so and so was rich. Fir'aun had power. This man, Allah gives him two gardens, not ordinary gardens. Don't think of the tiny gardens that you and I, we have. Huge gardens, massive gardens. And these gardens were full of grapes, vineyards, and he had date palms and other vegetations as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Kiltal jannatain atat ukulaha. And these two gardens used to give him full harvest. For those of you who know a little bit about farming and you know, you could even read up on it because this is what we do when we go through the tafsir. Uh, basically, when Allah says inab, when Allah says grapes, we try to analyze and the scholars go into lengthy discussions. Subhanallah, grapes are not like any other ordinary fruit. You have to uh, put in a lot of care. It's uh, initially, it's, you could read up on it. It's a weak plant that needs to be strengthened so that its root system is strengthened. You need to give it a lot of support until it grows. I was just reading up on it so much to the extent, subhanAllah, uh, you have farmers stating that initially the first harvest should be plucked even before it is ripe so as to avoid burdening the young root system. Because if you were to leave uh, the fruits until it becomes fully ripe, what could happen is that the root system could become damaged. So we're, we're talking about very fragile, very uh, delicate plants that are quite costly being in the middle and you have date palms around, strong, sturdy date palms surrounding these grapes and protecting the grapes and in the midst of that you have other vegetation as well, subhanAllah. So this individual has two beautiful gardens and he's getting full harvest. So he was extremely wealthy. He had date palms, he had grapes, he had other vegetation, and he was getting full harvest from the two gardens. Now having declared all of this at the beginning, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on, he launches into a conversation that takes place between the owner of the two gardens and his neighbor, a friend of his. Allah says that one day, what happens is, وَكَانَ لَهُ ثَمَرْ فَقَالَ لِصَاحِبِهِ وَهُوَ يُحَابِرُهُ أَنَا أَكْثَرُ مِنْ كَمَالَ وَأَعَزُّ نَفَرًا Now one day, he was talking to his neighbor, he was talking to his friend, okay? And then in the midst of the conversation, what happens is he says, أَنَا أَكْثَرُ مِنْ كَمَالَ وَأَعَزُّ نَفَرًا Now this is the point that we hope to be highlighting and, and touching on because I hope to talk on, on, on pride, on arrogance, about uh, comparing yourself with others and looking down upon others, subhanAllah. Now he didn't obviously go up to his friend and just rub it in his face. He didn't just uh, knock at the door of the house of his friend and say, you know what, I'm, I'm richer than you, I'm wealthier than you, no. This was a general conversation. They were talking to one another and in the midst of the conversation, he says, Ana akhtaru min kamala. The one who has two gardens, he says, I'm richer than you. I'm wealthier than you. And he doesn't stop at that. He also says, wa a'azzu nafara. Now this term can be interpreted in a few ways. One is that he says, I have more manpower than you. And this is clearly understood because he has two gardens. And it's not easy, like I said, to maintain vineyards. You, you, you need a lot of resources. So he obviously has a lot more people working under him. He says, I have a lot more manpower than you do. I have a lot of people working under me. So he says, I have a lot more resources than you do. And another interpretation is that I have more children than you do. I have another interpretation is that I have a bigger family than you do. 
وَأَعَزُ And he also uses this particular term that can also be defined as, you know, uh, people respect me more, me and my family. People respect us. We have a lot more prestige uh, than you do. So what is he doing now? He's boasting. And you would also observe in the flow of the ayat, in the first few ayat, Allah says, جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ We gave him two gardens. وَحَفَفْنَاهُمَا Again, you see, نَحْنُ The pronoun we, جَعَلْنَا حَفَفْنَا Okay? These ayat, one after the other, Allah is saying, we gave him gardens, we gave him the date palms, we made sure that a river ran between the two gardens. He didn't have to look or work hard towards a, you know, a man-made irrigation system. He had this natural irrigation system where he had a river running between the two gardens. We did it, we gave him, we gave him, we gave him, Allah says. And then what does he do? He goes to his friend and he says, Ana أَكْثَرُ min kamala. He says, I am richer than you. Now do you see how his ego takes over him? I and subhanallah, don't you think it's relevant in our lives as well? And this is why we have a hadith from the Prophet wasallam. An individual who has even an atom's weight of pride in him, that individual will not enter Jannah. May Allah save us all. Today we look at ourselves, oh I'm successful, I hold a good job, I own a huge house, I'm running around in an expensive vehicle, I have this kind of a bank balance. I have all these materialistic possessions with me. My children are studying abroad at really good universities. Or my child is a doctor and I spent this much on him to educate him. And we tend to compare ourselves with others. And you know, when we perhaps have functions in our families, we tend to splurge, we tend to spend a lot of money. And on top of that, we want to rub it in the faces of others. We like to boast. Allah says, even an atom's weight of pride that individual will not enter Jannah. And the story goes on now. What happens? He boasts, he rubs it in the face of his neighbor, his friend. Okay, he says, Ana aktharu min kamala wa a'azu nafara. He says all of this and now wadakhala jannatahu. He turns towards his garden, he turns towards his huge mansion. He's making his way inside. Wa huwa zalimun li nafsih. As Allah says in the Quran, he had wronged himself initially. As we were reading the ayat, it seemed as if he was wronging his friend by rubbing it in his face. His friend was being quiet because his friend didn't have anything to say. This man's rubbing it in my face, he's making me seem so lowly. And it's clearly understood that if one individual's assets are being mentioned and the other is not being mentioned, he's obviously poor, he's not doing that well. And now he's rubbing it in his face and he's keeping quiet. And now he enters his garden, he's proud, he's walking this pompous walk. What happens? He's wronging himself. And then, now he's so deluded. Shaitan seizes the opportunity. And this is what Shaitan loves. For you to be drowning in your pride. The minute you become bloated, the minute you become full of yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot fill you with himself. Because you're so full of yourself. How can you have Allah within you? You're full of yourself. You're so proud. You're bloated. He enters his garden. And he says, What does he say? He says, I don't think this will ever perish. I don't think my assets will ever perish. I don't think my investments will ever perish. Oh, don't worry. I've invested in Bitcoin. I'm sorted like for generations to come. Or oh, I've invested in this. I've invested in that. So I'm sorted. And so many of my generations are sorted. Even if they were to just chill at home. They have nothing to worry about it because in terms of wealth, we have so much of money. I don't think it'll ever perish. All it does is keeps multiplying, multiplying. So this is the same delusion that he was in. He enters the garden and he thinks to himself, All of this is never ever going to perish. And then what does he do? He does even something even worse. He goes into even worse heresy. He says, I don't think the day of Qiyamah will even come about. I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He talks about His anger, He talks about His punishments, He talks about the day of Qiyamah, He talks about taking us all into account. Maybe it's just to instill some fear in us, but I really don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question me on the day of Qiyamah. And then He goes on to say, وَلَا إِرُّدِدْتُ إِلَىٰ Rabbi." Okay, say, even if I am going to be taken up in front of my Lord, in front of Allah, and that's how we understand that he's a Muslim. He's not a disbeliever. He says, Rabbi, my Lord. He believes in Allah, but he's being deluded. Shaitan is making him drift away. He says, If Allah in this world has given me so much of wealth, okay, it's clearly a sign because look at my neighbor. 
He's not running around in an expensive car. He's not living in a mansion. I'm the one living in a mansion. I'm the one running around in an expensive car. I'm the one who has two huge gardens. So this is obviously a sign that Allah loves me. So if he has given me so much in this world, no doubt he's going to give me many times more in the next world. Again, deluded. Subhanallah. You see, the thing is, the principle is don't ever think that you being blessed with wealth is a sign that Allah loves you. Wealth and poverty are not signs that Allah loves you or Allah hates you. Subhanallah. Sometimes your wealth is a test from Allah. Sometimes your poverty is a test from Allah. Allah gives wealth to those whom he hates, dislikes and those whom he loves as well. You see Fir'aun, his dominion, no one had a dominion in the sense as Allah talks in the Quran. At that time, he was such a powerful ruler. But just because he was given such a dominion and such power and such rule, did it mean that Allah loved him? Subhanallah. No. And you take the prophets, you very rarely see a prophet being exorbitantly rich. Subhanallah. They face so many trials, challenges and difficulties. And now does that mean that Allah hates the prophets? No. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad was the most beloved unto Allah, the greatest of creation unto Allah. And look at how many trials and challenges he had to face. He comes out of his house one day hungry with no food at home. We know the narration, subhanallah. So wealth and poverty don't really determine as to whether Allah loves you or not. But he was deluded. He thought that oh, all this is for me because Allah loves me. So on the day of Qiyamah, I'm going to get much more. And then what happens? Now, when he rejects Allah, when he rejects the thought of the day of Qiyamah, his friend can't stand it anymore. I mean, you insult me, it's okay, I'll take the insult, it's fine. But here you are talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can't keep quiet. So what does he do? In a very diplomatic way, he advises his friend. He says, Lakinna, what does he say? Qala lahu sahibuhu wa huwa yuhabiruhu. Again, whilst talking, his friend says, Akafarta billadhi khalaqak. Are you denying the one who created you? Min turab, from clay, like how he created your father Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Thumma min nutufa, and then from a drop of fluid. Thumma sawaka rajula and then he fashioned you into becoming who you are now subhanallah look at his methodology he takes him back to his origins trying to make him realize trying to make him introspect and then he goes on to say Lakinna huwallahu rabbi. you know what you can say whatever you want to say you can deny Allah you can deny the day of Qiyamah but as for me huwallahu rabbi. Allah is my Lord Wala ushriku bi rabbi ahada. and I'm not going to associate anything any partner unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ayat go on my dear brothers in Islam this man after saying all of that he enters his garden only to find everything had been destroyed subhanallah as a test from Allah everything had been destroyed all of the wealth all of his vegetation all of the foliage all of these date palm trees that were put up as a security measure had been overturned everything had fallen and all of the crops had been destroyed subhanallah just before he enters the garden his friend advises him he says it would have been better than, you know, saying all these pompous statements for you to say, Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. I'll touch on that and I'll wrap off, inshallah. Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. It would have been better for you to, for you to say, Masha Allah, whatever Allah has willed has come to pass. La quwwata illa billah. There is no power, no might except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a very, very important statement. And we somehow have misunderstood this statement where we use Masha Allah. See, Masha Allah can be used generally, but we tend to use it in the wrong places. We think that Masha Allah can ward off evil eye. And that's where we use Masha Allah. But in reality, Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah should be used for your personal achievements, for your own possessions. Let's say you buy a new vehicle. You're coming out and you're admiring your new vehicle. Yes or no? At that point, you need to say Masha Allah. You're looking at your house and you're admiring your house. You're looking at your children. You're proud of your son for what he has achieved. Okay? At that point, you need to say Masha Allah. Why? Because there you're attributing the power to Allah. You're saying what Allah has willed has happened. Allah willed for my son to graduate, so my son graduated. Not because, oh, he's my product and obviously because I'm so intelligent, that's why he's intelligent, subhanAllah. Or oh, I bought this car out of my wealth, this house, I built it with my own hands. No, Masha Allah, because Allah willed it, it happened. Whatever Allah has willed has happened. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power, no might except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The friend, he advises him to do that, but he doesn't do that. He enters in a pompous way only to find out everything had been destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a test. 
put forth unto him. And towards the end of the story, he laments, he grieves, and he says, Ya laytani, woe be unto me, I should not have ascribed partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beauty of the story is that despite him losing all of his wealth, he turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the story and that's what's important. Wealth can be gained again. You can earn your wealth again. But losing your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, drifting away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only to become a loser in the next world, the eternal life of the hereafter, that is pure loss. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all.